So my name is Daniel. Uh, the, the guy who I started A Sharp with, Peter, is also here as well. And so basically, we had this, we had our own personal experiences where we were interested in community solar and couldn't really figure out how to wrap our heads around it, how does it work, uh, to really understand the basics of it, and couldn't really find one convenient place to go and shop for a subscription. And so basically, what we've tried to do is build a web application that allows someone to come on and get, get educated about community solar, get their questions answered, and then when they're ready, uh, basically sign up to be able to get quotes from the developers and then be able to shop amongst those quotes to see if one, if you want to join in the first place, and then two is if you do want to join, then uh, which one, who you want to go with. And it's designed to, designed to be very simple, and very hassle-free. Um, now that all said, actually what we'll do is we'll start with just talking for 10 or 15 minutes about what community solar is, for those of you who aren't aware of kind of the details. And then maybe the last kind of five or 10 minutes or so will actually show you the, the web application. So we'll actually focus most just on what Community Solar is. Um, and then kind of the, the last thing before we dig in is um, this is a great group size for just asking questions throughout. So please, you know, just fire away. Don't, don't wait until the end. It'll be a lot more interesting for all of us. So, um, so just to start with, so why, you know, why sign up for Community Solar? There's really two main reasons. The first is, uh, actually, let me take a step back. Who in here is a customer of Excel Energy? Who, who gets their electricity from Excel? Okay, so almost everyone, but does that mean there's a few of you that maybe a co-op or a muni that gives you your electricity? I do too. What's that? I do too. You do too, okay, all right. So in Minnesota, this, the uh, state legislature passed a community solar bill a few years back. And that required Excel Energy to run a community solar program. And the way that it's set up and run is it's actually designed to be able to save you money on your electricity bill. And at the same time, you also obviously support the development of local solar installations and help Excel to meet their solar targets, right? And so those are, those are kind of the reasons why this, this could be of interest. And so in terms of just what it is, so, um, a lot of you guys, I know talking with you guys earlier, a couple of you guys have solar on your house. So the way that community solar is designed to work is that it's supposed to mimic having solar on your house, but instead of having it on your house, maybe because you rent or you live in a condo or you don't have like a nice south facing exposure to your house, instead of having it on your house, you basically get the production from a shared solar installation. Or to use the Minnesota parlance, a, sh uh, a community solar garden. Every state uses a slightly different vernacular on that. So the idea is, is that you subscribe to a certain amount of electricity from the shared solar installation, and you pay the provider for that electricity, but then you get a credit on your Excel bill. And that credit on your Excel bill exceeds what it is you pay for your subscription, thereby saving you money. So that's, that's kind of at a very high level. Kind of just the next level down, is you know here's basically the kind of the three entities involved again you're paying the provider for your subscription that installation is hooked to the distribution grid of the utilities network so for excel's case it's the hooked to the distribution grid of excel's network not the transmission infrastructure but the down at the distribution level it's not it's not not hooked to your house um, that electricity then you don't get the electricity physically directly, but effectively that electricity feeds Excel's grid and then Excel's grid feeds you. And again, while you pay the community solar provider, you get the bill credit from Excel. So kind of the biggest question that people have is kind of how, how that part, how the bill works. So basically before you'd have one bill from the utility Excel, afterwards you'd have that same bill. So this is, think of these as just kind of numbers over an entire year. Um, you'd have to use quite a bit of electricity to, to have that big of a bill for one month. So you'd have the same bill, in this case $1,450, but then the bill credit, so that net you'd only pay Excel $48 over the course of the year. And then combined with your community solar bill, you will have paid a total of $1,340 for effectively your electricity services, as opposed to the $1,450 that you were paying before, thereby saving you about $100 that Um, so, so that's kind of what it looks like at a, at a kind of really high level. Typically, 
Um, the way that people subscribe to the community solar is the, 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 the subscriber agreements that you would sign with that provider are structured in such a way that you, you pay a specific amount per unit of electricity that that installation generates, right? So you pay a certain amount per kilowatt hour, per kWh. And that, your agreement actually spells out what you pay over the life of the agreement. And usually what is what, is what we call is an increasing price model. So it's a fixed amount the first year, and then it increases at a fixed escalator, maybe 2% per year, right? What you get as a bill credit, you know what it is for the first year. So this year in Excel's territory, the bill credit is, fifth, for a residential subscriber, it's 15.31 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's, that's what you'll get as a bill credit this year. What you don't actually know in advance is you don't know how that will increase in the future. Because effectively, that bill credit floats with the prevailing price of electricity for residential consumers. Right? And so you're, you're locking in what you're paying for your subscription. And, and then you're, 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 um, you're going to get a bill credit that you know is going to save you money from day one. And so long as it, may, it stays below what you're going to get or going to get for a bill credit in the future, you continue to save money. And so historically, in Excel service territory, the, the electric rates have meant that that bill credit has historically increased at uh, a little over 3% per year, 3.3% per year. Right? Where a lot of subscriptions, basically, they, they might start out lower, but then only increase at 1.75% or 2% per year. And so it's kind of shown schematically in this graph here, where the red line is what you're paying, and the, and the blue line is what you're getting for a bill credit. Now, that said, it's possible that actually the bill credit rate could increase a little bit more slowly, so you could save less, or maybe even kind of break even or less than break even over the duration. But there's also a chance on the flip side that it increase, could increase more and your savings would be even greater. Right. Yeah? And also bill credit, that's what Excel would pay? That's what Excel shows you on your bill. So and that's based on actual cost of electricity? So what, what it is, the, the technical way that it's defined, or defined is um, for anyone who signed up for an installation that was applied for relatively recently. The rules are kind of changing, but in the kind of the current rules, um, it's, it's not what they charge you in terms of per KWH on your bill. Actually, what it is is they take all of the revenue they take in from residential subscribers, and they divide it by the total number of KWH they've sold to everyone. So it's kind of like an average rate. And so it's not just the electric rate, but includes like the riders, that get tacked on, right? Or the fuel adjust adjustment charges, right? So it kind of tries to wrap all of that in. But it does include total costs. Yeah. Yes. It's meant to include the total costs. I wonder if I could just follow up. Yeah. Said, they take their total costs and divide that by the electricity. They take their sold. total. They take the total revenue from revenue. residential and divide it by the total amount of electricity. So I'm wondering if a lot of people sign up for solar mm -hmm. credits. How does that change their calculation? So if, uh, if a lot of people sign up, um, basically, so it is in some ways, right, it is, a, it is a bit of a form of a subsidy, right? Not unlike actually net metering, right? And so if, if, every, you know, if everyone were to sign up, basically it would increase the price of electricity a little bit, but then those who are participating are still saving relative to that. Does that bring down the revenue? What's that? It's meant to be revenue neutral for Excel. It's meant to be kind of a pass through. Yeah. Who owns the community solar panels themselves? Is, yeah. What is their relationship to, to Excel? Yeah. So, in, so, so uh, community solar comes in two different varieties. Some utilities, like for example, some of the co-ops around the state, it's actually the utility that owns the installations themselves and offers subscriptions. But in Excel, actually, the state statute requires that Excel let third party providers come in and build the installations, interconnect them, and offer the subscriptions. So, so there's. Are they or the so they're actually, the, the <coughs> providers, it, it would be like. Um, so some examples of people who are doing it are Geronimo Energy or Innovative Power Systems or Community Energy Solar or Property Energy Future. So uh, basically, it's a, it's a lot of companies that have built. Uh, wind and solar projects that are then building them and connecting and offering subscriptions. They're technically not a utility, 
uh, rather just an owner and operator of that, of that solar facility. Right. And there's maybe a couple dozen uh, of them that are active in Minnesota right now. Out of those, maybe five are actively offering subscription to residential subscribers, and a couple more I'm thinking about. So, yeah. Yes. Has yeah. the current legislature gone after this, like everything else in solar? So it, you know, there they have not gone after it. And so, for example, even in the current session, where, for example, there was an energy omnibus bill that that was looking at going after a lot of things, you know, they made in Minnesota. Uh, credits, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Community solar uh, for that Excel program has largely been untouched. Um, so after after the Excel program was enacted by statute, then the Public Utilities Commission uh, shortly after put rules that kind of gave the specific guidelines for how a provider can you know, build a project and interconnect it and so forth. And so those rules um, they've sort of gone back and forth over time, but at this point, there's actually quite a bit of stability to them. They sort of have been worked out in the previous years. And just so you guys know, uh, Minnesota actually recently became the state with the largest amount of community solar in the country. Mm -hmm. So um, the statistic from about a month ago was that uh, 72 megawatts of community solar had been built in Excel's territory and energized and serving the subscribers. It's probably actually a little bit more than that now, but that's just the last number that I have in my head. Um, and you know, the next kind of number two and number three are uh, Massachusetts and Colorado, and they're kind of around 30 megawatts. By the end of this year, it's expected that Excel will actually have maybe around 300 megawatts of community solar installed. And that's, that's Excel projecting that. And they're the ones that are going to have probably the kind of the best insight in terms of how much is going to get built because they're the ones that are sort of tracking how fast they're getting interconnected. Um, certainly, there will be more built in 2018 as well. Um, there was uh, close to 200 megawatts of applications for new installations by the end of the last year, and they have two years to build. And so, just if you look out in the future, it still looks like there's been quite a bit of activity over the next. Kind of 12 to 18 months for sure, and then beyond that, it's a little too early to tell. Thanks for the questions. Um, so kind of the, the last piece, just in terms of understanding how community solar works, is uh, it's important to realize that so most, there are some subscriptions that allow you to pay up front. Kind of like if you were to build solar panels in your house, you could pay up front and get the benefit over time. But almost all of them are basically this pay-as-you-go model that we just talked through in this last case. And so because you're paying as you, as you go, uh, they ask you to sign a long-term agreement, right? They're typically actually around 25 years. And so this, for a lot of people, kind of opens your eyes, right? Like you're asking me to sign a 25-year agreement, right? Um, and so the reason that they are long-term agreements is because they need to have those agreements in place to be able to get the financing for their project. So they line up a bunch of subscribers, and then like, okay, we know we have a lot of subscriptions, and we know that they're gonna pay us for these subscriptions, then they can go to the bank and get the money to build the installation, right? Now that said, um, yeah. So when they do that, mm -hmm. and you've signed up for the 25 year agreement, yeah. it starts on the day you signed up, that would have been in operation for four years later. So it depends on your agreement. So some of them, a lot of the ones that I've seen sign up for when the installation is energized and starts providing new electricity. Um, but there's usually, a lot of them will have something like a two year period where if the installation doesn't get built within two years, then you're, you, you can exit the agreement, right? So that's what, that's what a lot of them are, but they vary a little bit, yeah. If it gets built within two years, or if it's not operational, mm -hmm. then you have two years from the date. If so, let's say you sign your agreement today, yeah. right? Then most of the agreements are a lot. I shouldn't say most. A lot of the agreements will have a provision that says, if we don't, if we don't build and energize the installation within two years, then you can exit the agreement. So two years from the day that you signed. And then, and then when it's energized is when that 25 year period starts. That word energize though, what yeah. if they build it, energize it, but then have problems? Yeah, so, so if there are issues, they're actually required by the regulations to first of all, just provide you notification if things are down. 
And then actually a lot of them, a lot of the agreements will also say that if it's down consistently or certain periods of time, there may be ways for you to exit. But the other thing to remember is that you're only paying for the electricity that it provides you. So if its production is down for a little bit, you know, maybe it comes offline because there's an issue with the inverter and it takes a few weeks for them to get the new inverter in. You're only paying for the electricity, for your share of the electricity it generates. And so it means that you're getting a smaller bill credit, but you're also paying less. And so you, sit, you still save, you just save less because it's not. Well, what you um, pay what's that? Yep. So that's something you have to be careful of. Yeah, that's something you have to think about if you pay up front. So what would be the benefit of paying up front? So the, usually the benefit of paying up front is that there are, there's a much greater lifetime savings. There's a much greater lifetime savings. Because so, if you think about it, you know, if it's a pay-as-you-go model, they have to go and get financing, and the bank is going to take their cut. And so, and so by paying up front, they don't need to get financing. So you can effectively take all that value back for yourself as the person who pays up front. And so there, there's, there's definitely, there's a little less certainty, right, in terms of what'll, how it'll play out. But, but if it works, if it works sort of as is expected, then you'll save a lot more, right? And so it's a bit of a trade-off, right, in terms of what you would prefer in terms of a kind of a risk reward. So does the subscriber have to write one check to the investor and another check to Excel? So, so, uh, so a subscriber, when it's active, so you, you, you write one check to the, to the operator, to the, the provider of the community solar, and then, and then you still have to manage your Excel bill. And it's just like your old Excel bill, except for it has this bill credit. So that, yeah, you do have to still pay that, but it'll, you know, the difference is, is that the sum of those two will be less than what you paid previously or what, what you would have otherwise paid. But you do have to handle two bills. And usually, usually, as you guys all know, Excel, you can set up just like an auto pay. And I think most of the providers for residential subscriptions also lets you just set up an auto pay and go paperless. So you don't have to, you know, so you don't have to actually physically deal with two checks if you don't want to. Is there a different um, credit for the commercial yep. customers? Yep. And what was the, what's roughly that? Yeah, so, so um, the, basically the calculation works the same way. So. They take in, for, for what's called a general service customer in Excel's territory, it's if you average one megawatt of demand, or 100, uh, 1,000 kW or more of demand. And so it's a pretty large customer, right? And so, but it's the same idea there where they take in all the revenues for that rate class and divide it by all the kWh sold to that rate class, and that's how they come up with the bill credit. In addition, there's a, a, a renewable energy credit value as well for all of these. And so that's, that's a, it, it fluctuates a little bit year, year to year, but it's around, two and three quarters of a cent lower than the residential bill credit rate. So if you were a small general mm -hmm. service or a commercial, mm -hmm. you would you would get you would, just by your rate that you pay determines if you're gonna get the commercial rate versus the residential? It, what rate class, whatever rate class you're in with Excel, that's what determines what your bill credit rate is. I see. But then usually what happens is that the providers offer different subscription terms to general to, for example, commercial industrial facilities or municipal co-ops. And you know, the, the difference there is they're able to offer a little, they're able to offer a lower subscription rate relative to residential because they need many fewer of those customers to fill up a garden versus it could take you a couple hundred residential subscribers to fill up a garden, which takes a lot more work to get those people involved and manage, you know, and, and administrate that over time. Right? Yeah. So even even though you're getting less of a of a, of a a bill credit, you're still, it's still designed, or it, the, the intent is still to be able to save money through it. And do they limit you to the 120 roll um, mm -hmm. for both the commercial and the yeah. residential? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know um, what that is referring to, so you're, you're able to subscribe up to 120% of your average consumption. So you can actually subscribe to a little bit more than you use on a regular basis. Um, so that's one of the constraints in terms of what you can sign up for. The other is, is that any, any specific solar garden needs to have at least five unique subscribers to it, right? So it's meant that there's a lot of participation. It's not just one large company in the garden. Yeah. So I've subscribed, I've paid up, up front. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I want to put one in my garage. Yeah. Can I do that? Yeah. 
So if, if, so if you want to put solar on your garage, you'd still want to stay within okay. that maximum, okay. that 120% that maximum. So you could do it, but you just want to, would want to make sure that you're within that um, threshold. Mm -hmm. so. I had some similar questions that yeah. I just asked. So let's say you sign up for 120%. Yeah. And then let's say over time you find either your usage goes up or whatever, then you could add panels to your roof to get back up to that 120. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you can't do that metering anymore, right? Because you're giving up your ability to do that, right? Um, I'm going to actually refrain from answering that just because it's a little bit out of my depth to know if you're still eligible for net metering with rooftop installation if you're also subscribed to Community Solar and exactly how that works. So, but I can try and look into that for you. Okay. Yeah. With regard to the 120%, let's say I sign up for the 120% and over time I get a lot more energy efficient and so yeah. using people less and less. Does my subscription capacity remain constant for the term? Mm -hmm. So then if, let's say I get really efficient, or yeah. I go to Florida for some number of months, don't use much electricity, Yeah. do I end up making money on the production and not having to pay? You, you pay for what you use. Yeah. So like, let's see, I would pay for what's being produced by the solar garden, mm -hmm. and I would get a credit mm -hmm. for more from Excel and if there was nothing to do, I would get mm -hmm. money, a check, yeah. a credit from myself. Right? So your subscription size, your subscription, you, you subscribe to a certain size, a certain kilowatt hours per month initially, right? right? And so if your usage fluctuates, that'll kind of still be the same. But it's actually important to know that typically, as you guys all know, solar installations degrade slightly over time, right? They just produce a little bit less every year. So actually, in a case where you're becoming a little bit less efficient, it wouldn't be surprised if it kind of mirrors some of that degradation. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now you've gone ahead and you've got a solar, part of a solar community, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it puts them on your garage. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you want to sell your house to get out of the community 10 years later. It's a great question. <laughs> so. Um, right, so this is so now we're going to kind of bring it back to the you know what we were saying that uh, typically in a pay-as-you-go arrangement, not the upfront arrangement, um, they're asking you to sign a long-term agreement so they can get the money in place to build the installation, right? And so the natural question to ask is what you know how do I get out of that agreement? Right? And so there's there's five typical kind of buckets of things that you might want to do to transfer or exit from your agreement, or at least this is the way that we've kind of tried to kind of categorize them. And so um, the first is moving within the utility service territory. So this is just you're an Excel customer over here, and now you're moving down the block to a different residence, right? Um, so there's a rule that you need to be within, within one county of the installation that you subscribe to. And so basically almost every agreement allows you to move premise while still being within one county with little to no hassle or cost. Usually you're just basically telling them what your, your new premise is, right? If anything, there's only just a very small administrative fee. The second is, is you might want to transfer it to someone else for some reason. So for example, if you move out of your house, perhaps you want to transfer it to the person who purchases your house, well, right? What's that? If the new person yeah. has more use. So if the new person moves into your house, generally speaking, they look at the usage within that house. So that actually usually isn't too much of an issue if you're transferring it to the same house. But to transfer it to someone else for a different premise, you need to make sure it's within 120% of their usage. Mm -hmm. And that's actually usually, most agreements allow that, that sort of transfer to someone else, again, without a lot of hassle, it's usually a relatively small maybe a small administrative charge to be able to do that, $50 or $75, which you know, is kind of typically well within the savings for any given, given, given year. Um, the third one is moving out of the service territory altogether. So you're an Excel customer, and now you move somewhere else, right? You move, you know, you move to somewhere uh, in Chicago, right, where Excel doesn't provide electricity. Um, 
Uh, this is, usually most agreements for residential subscribers address this in some way. They spell out what, you know, what are your options. And it kind of ranges. Some of them actually make it very easy for you to get out of the agreement. You know, again, maybe just with like a small administrative fee, 50 or $75. But some of them charge a little bit more than that. There's actually quite, it varies quite a bit. So this is actually something if you're thinking about subscribing, it's really useful to think about. You know, if you think there's a decent chance you might move in five years, you might be more interested in subscribing to something that's easier to get out of. Conversely, if you just, you know, if you feel like you've planted roots, you know, maybe you don't mind as much if that's a little bit higher, if maybe there's some other benefits, maybe you're saving more or something like that, right? Um, the fourth one is what we call an emergency exit. So this, this can be anything from some defined as like cases of divorce, some, you know, someone passes away, things like that, they're usually relatively lenient on that or silent on that, so it can vary a little bit. Um, but then the last one is just what we call an arbitrary exit. If you wanna, if you wanna exit your agreement for kind of any reason. Um, and so generally speaking, those first two are usually, they're allowed and it's not too much of a hassle. The second two, it kind of varies a little bit. And the third one's usually a little bit more costly, right? And that's because again, because they're trying to raise financing for their project based off these agreements, they'd like you to have a good reason for if you want to exit it. Right. So. So, so that is actually kind of most of the community solar story, right, in terms of how you pay for it, how you get your bill credit, the length of the agreements, and what it means kind of getting out. And so actually before we kind of switch over to just showing you a little bit about what what we're trying to do in terms of making a shopping tool for community. So maybe we'll just kind of pause here and see if you guys have any questions. Not that you guys haven't already asked a whole bunch, but if you guys have any more questions. I actually brought five questions with me, and I think we've covered two or three of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Lazy it <laughs> So. Um, oh, the glasses are coming out. <laughs> talked about if you do it on your roof, so that will make you covered. Um, then, so, in these agreements, do, do you know if it, many or any stipulate whether or not the originator will maintain ownership and servicing of the plan for the, like, the, the term of the agreement? Or will they bundle them and solve like mortgages? Yeah, yeah. So, so it does happen that sometimes the entity that starts the project doesn't ultimately build and operate it. They might start it and then sell it to another entity which builds it and operates it. And usually there's something in agreement that says something about an assignment. And so they might have the right to basically assign that agreement to someone else. So basically transfer it to someone who would you know, for example, buy that project from them. So, so owner, yep, it's very common and ownership does transfer. It's like a mortgage, you don't know who's gonna service it. Okay, and then um, I've actually talked to two different community solar people yeah. and I was close to signing one and I hesitated, I'm glad I'm here so I can get Great. educated before I do, I do want to do it, but, um, you know, many of these agreements appear to provide lots of details about it terms and conditions about how these things work. Yeah. But they don't provide anything really about the details of the panels that you're yeah. committing to subscribe to. Yeah. And if we put them on a roof, you shop, you buy the best panels, you work with a reputable yeah. installer, you can look at the specs, the data yeah. sheets, how good they're going to work over <coughs> time, whether it's new technology, old technology, yeah. how reliable are they, reads and reviews. Here it's all kind of hidden and we just trust us we're going to yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. You are an engineer because you want to know about that. Um, so it's a great question to ask of a provider, and some providers will be able to give you a very thorough answer, and some won't. And the reason that some won't is because depending on where they are in terms of signing up subscribers versus going through procurement, they they might not even know, right? Because they haven't gone out to bid for certain of the components or even the panels themselves, right? Now, in the case where you own solar on your own roof, right, obviously you really want to know what that equipment is because how much it produces, you're going to, you're going to see that in terms of how much net metering credits you get back, right? 
With Community Solar, with this pay-as-you-go model, because you're only paying for the KW, you're only paying the provider for the, the KWH that you subscribe to, you're only getting credits for what they produce. Even though you don't know, at, at the very least, they have the incentive to try and use good equipment because they do better the more KWH, just like you do better the more KWH. So it's, it's a question you should ask of each individual provider, and some will have an answer, and some won't. Right. And I'll relate a similar question. Do you know of any of these solar, community solar um, charges use tracking arrays versus just fixed? Because you get about twice the output. Yeah. Yeah, do you guys, does everyone know what, what tracking arrays are? So the basic idea is that they track from, from uh, east to west as the, uh, so panels face east and then west over the course of the day. Um, and, and then they, they tilt them manually then, you know, between the seasons to get the angle right. Um, so I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know specific numbers, but I know some of them do. And generally speaking, if you just look at larger scale installations of solar, the trend in the United States is towards more single access tracking, okay. right? And to the point where, I, I want to be careful about throwing actual numbers, but it may even surpass 50% of new installations being single access tracking. So it's gotten to be pretty common for larger installations. And these ones are usually, you know, an installation that covers a few acres, yeah. um, right? It makes it's, a big difference. Makes a big difference. No, I think that's it. Thanks. What happens after 25 years if you're with it? Yeah. Do you get to, do you own them or? So it's it's not um, in the so if you prepaid for it, then actually it, it continues, right? Mm -hmm. If you do one of these pay as you go arrangements, typically you don't actually own them, and so then your interest in those you know stops after 25 years, right? And what happens that you know the Community Solar has only been around for a few years, so none of these have actually run out to their life. Um, so it's possible they would come back to you and say, hey, if you want to continue to subscribe just on a month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year basis here in terms, some of them might do something else with the installations. Um, but so generally speaking, you know, at least for planning purposes, you should expect it to end after the, the 25 years. Like the lease. What if you, mm -hmm. what if you buy a contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and if you do it for 25 years only? If you do a prepay model, then typically actually then it goes for basically as long as the installation is still active. Okay. Right? And that'll, you know, again, a lot of these will depend a little bit on what any specific provider is offering, but rules of thumb. What about insurance? So you got a major storm and picks up panels. Yeah. Yeah. How's that usually going to work? Uh, so all these all these have insurance on them. So actually there was um, there's a, an example of a, a project that at the end of the winter was under construction and most of it was ripped up by a big storm, but insurance paid for all of it. And so all of them need to have the insurance in place. Um, I forget, there's a, there's a set of materials that um, the regulations require that a provider uh, offer to a subscriber, and I think one of them may actually be some of the insurance information. I'd have to double check on that. But um, they're all, yeah, mm -hmm. they're all insured. And especially as someone in a prepay model, you care quite a bit about that. You care about it as paid as well, but you're, you know, you're not as sensitive to it in that case. Do any of the solar gardens that you know of assign individual panels to individual purchasers? You know, you know, yeah, they, they generally don't sign individual panels. Um, so they don't like, you know, say this set of three is for you and four is for you and that sort of thing. They usually assign it, you know, uh, they usually have a certain capacity rated in kilowatts, and they usually assign everyone a certain fraction of that. So you might have three and a half kilowatts, four and a half kilowatts, and that's kind of thing, but then they don't decompose it by panel. That'd be kind of fun though, right? You could have your engraved panel, you could go out and see. Well, you clean your panel on. Yeah, yeah. Just like an actual community garden, right? What I've seen is that most of these purchase agreements, the cost of solar has to be cheaper than Excel's regular rate. Mm -hmm. Yet, Excel's energy sources are a combination of coal, nuclear, mm -hmm. um, wind, which I assume are a little more expensive. So, how does that figure? Or is solar getting, solar getting cheaper now? Uh, solar is quite cheap at this point. Does um, it compete with coal and 
In maybe not yes. maybe not outright in the Minnesota market, but it certainly does in certain other but at markets. At least in these purchase agreements, it sounds like it does. Yeah. So 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 the reason the part of the reason that you're able to save money on this is because your bill credit is not only basically that that first part, which is the kind of the related to the retail rate of electricity, but there's also an additional component for the renewable energy credits that Excel pays for to help meet their renewable energy obligations. Oh, I see. So, so it's, not just, it's not just kind of an apples to apples in terms of what the rates, there's that extra renewable energy credit value to help them meet their obligations. Is that energy credit vulnerable politics? Uh, uh, in, this, in this case, the, the agreements that Excel has with these providers is also for the 25 years. And so that's locked in and so, um, you know, I, I think it would be fair to say that that's, it's a very low probability event that that would be vulnerable. Now, is that the component that you talked about earlier that you calculate based on revenue? So that's, that's the base rate, and then there's the renewable energy credit on top of that. Right? So the one I talked about earlier was that, and that actually makes up the majority of it. That's in the case of residential subscribers, it's 13.3 cents per kWh, and then it's 2 cents per kWh for the renewable energy credit value. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding there is no current value on the renewable energy credit in Minnesota. I mean, is that a market for it? Or? So the, the, I'm not as familiar with the kind of renewable energy credit market in Minnesota sort of as a whole, but within this program, it's very clearly defined that it's two cents per kWh that gets tacked onto your bill credit. Maybe they're anticipating, and they're paying it for it in anticipation yeah. that it'll be valuable later. Yeah. So, so, so Excel has a solar specific requirement to get one and a half percent of their generation by solar. So this credit is basically them buying that solar credit value to help meet from you, from you to meet that obligation, right? And so even if there's not a market for them to buy credits from elsewhere to meet that obligation, there is a value for that credit, right? Which you're receiving as a subscriber. So is any of this what we just talked about in our own personal taxes? In in a pay-as-you-go model, it does not affect your taxes because it's effectively like a lease. Right? If you do have a prepay model, it's possible that it could impact your taxes in a beneficial way because there's an investment tax credit on solar that would allow you to recoup some of that prepay value. And I certainly know of some states where participants in community solars have been able to claim that tax credit. And I'm not as familiar with the cases here in Minnesota because there hasn't been a lot of, as many of the, there hasn't been many prepaid installations built yet. And so I, I'm, I'm not familiar if you're able to cre uh, claim that credit, but it's a great thing to ask your provider. That, that was a nod of, let's check that out. <laughs> yeah. So just checking on um, risk, vulnerability, um, as far as, I, I think, uh, I'm using the right words, the, uh, the rate you pay the mm -hmm. uh, solar provider yeah. with the fixed guaranteed rate of increase. Yeah. That is what it is. Mm -hmm. right? So I can be more and certainly not going to be less. Yes. Right? And so given that, you now know what you're going to pay for electricity for the next 25 years. Yep, you're right? locked in. So yep. maybe that's good. Yeah. But, and historically, rates have gone up faster. Mm -hmm. But in the rare event that the fossil fuel industry can manipulate prices and we now have an abundance of coal, rates go down or don't go up as fast, then maybe you're not saving money. I mean, I don't ask if it's possible, but yeah. theoretically that yeah. could happen. It is theoretically possible. And so when you look at how much you would pay in a pay-as-you-go model for, for a subscription, it's important to look at how that price increases over time relative to potentially what the, would happen with the price of electricity over time. So for example, um, you know, if you, if you have an initial rate plus a, in a 1% escalator versus an initial rate plus a 4% escalator, right, there'd be a lot more risk in the case of a 4% escalator that you wouldn't save money over time, right? Now remember, Excel's historic rates have increased at 3.3%, right? That's what they kind of quote as, as something to kind of compare 
a potential, bill, uh, a potential subscription rate increase at, right? And so, you know, for example, a couple of providers in our service, they're, one of them is 2% and then at 2% for eight years and at 0% thereafter. Another one I think is 1.75%. And so, you know, they're oftentimes, you know, at least the ones in our service are around half of what it's been historically, right? And so, you know, it is possible, right, if electricity rates don't decline or, or don't increase much at all, right? Um, but, you know, the, the flip side of that is that, you know, if it's based off historic, you're going to just save more over time. And then if it goes up even more, you're going to save quite a bit more. So what, in your estimation, what do you think are the primary drivers that could affect whether rates go down or low? You know, let's say there's an abundance of coal or things get, you know, political forces drive it low or technological factors or all of a sudden we start building nukes or something. Mm -hmm. What, what could happen in the next 25 years? Then you're a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to take a shot at that? So what's going to happen with electricity? If I knew what was going to happen with electricity prices in 25 years, I would be a trader. Yeah. Right. And I would, I would do that. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's obviously, there's a lot of factors, right? You know, various fuel costs, what they're building in terms of transmission in, in distribution infrastructure that they have to get their you know, that they, they have to pay off through rate increases. Same thing with new capacity builds, right? And so it's it's really hard to to look ahead. And so the best thing that, it, our perspective on it is the best thing to do is just look at it as what it's done historically, right? And that's this, you know, 3.3% increase. But we're in unprecedented situations. Sure. Where it depends on whether the lawmakers believe global warming or not, and whether we get serious about yeah. it. Paying our fair share for the real cost of energy. Yeah. Well, so far, Excel certainly hasn't changed their plans pre and post election. You know, so and those plans usually are out five or ten years. So, you know, at least at least for the near term, it's you know a lot, a lot of the same. So, I'm gonna well, go back one to of the things that we get to consider too is the cost of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And as we need to do the band aids and the replacements, those are going to be tacked onto our bill as well. Yeah. And so those are all going to contribute to what we end up paying monthly. And uh, if you're looking at things that accelerate the rate, then yeah. rather than decreasing the rate, one would imagine it'd be other, the opposite. The fact that things will rise or stay the same if you're lucky. Yep. Is it fair to say that if the demand for electricity goes up, let's say with electric vehicles in the next 10 years, that the rates will rise faster? It's hard to say as well. Yeah. Where's the income stream mostly for the community? So again, so again, as a subscriber, you pay the provider for your subscription and then get the bill credit from Excel. So basically the income is from your subscription payments to the provider. There is nothing in the form of their production or that's all bought and paid for. It's so, so, basic, so basically, you're, you're paying them for, for the production that you subscribe to. And then their agreement with Excel means that the Excel gives you the bill credit. Right? And Excel just passes it. Fixed cost. They What's that? But they're under a fixed cost. Mm -hmm. They put it up, it's done. 25 yeah. years from now, yep. they have maintenance yeah. at best, right? Yep. But so it, again, as a pay-as-you-go model, you're not paying anything up front. So they're asking for revenue over time. I'm just trying to figure yeah. out where all their income streams are. It's, it's, it's all from the subscription agreements, from the subscription payments. So there's no, there's no other. Okay. Else. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't quite understand that. First. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the cost of distribution. Yeah. The we all seen the big lines run up on the floor. Is that relevant only to Minnesota? And does Minnesota pay for it, or is that a national program? Yeah. So my question is, if we live in Minnesota and it's only Minnesota, we're probably going to realize that. Yeah. But if it's national, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's whatever. In the case of Excel's program, it's whatever Excel, whatever portion of uh, that transmission project that Excel sees. So if a transmission po project passes through and Excel doesn't have anything to do with it, it wouldn't impact. Oh. But if Excel uses that transmission line, they they pay for that, and that gets seen in the rates. Right. So I'm actually going to, um, these have been great questions, and so we have about 10 minutes left, and so I'm actually going to kind of do the last little piece and just kind of tell you what it is we're up to, but um, happy to you know, answer any final questions uh, when we're done. So obviously, right, uh, community solar generates a lot of questions, right? How does it work, right? And so, um, oops, last thing you guys want to see is a Twitter feed. So, um, so like we said, 
uh, when, when Peter and I were first you know, facing these questions for ourselves, just as, as individual consumers and potential subscribers, you know, we thought, wow, wouldn't it be useful to have some kind of a one-stop shop place to go and understand how this works better and then be able to actually shop for subscriptions. And so that's actually what we've tried to build here with A Sharp Energy. Um, so it's asharpenergy.com. Here we're actually showing you a non-live version, uh, mainly because this is being recorded so we don't actually show you actual quotes from uh, providers. So we're just gonna show you some fake quotes. Um, but again, it's asharpenergy.com. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen again at the end or you can take one of our cards. Um, so basically the, the web application has two big functions. The first is just kind of an educational piece. So it's trying to answer a lot of these same questions that you guys raised just now. And so, you know, there's, there's simple things from at the very high level, just trying to kind of estimate what you might be able to save or how many solar panels a subscription would be associated with and what the CO2 offset might be, right? Um, but then also getting into uh, just, you know, again, how does community solar work? This is the same graphic from that presentation. I'm trying to talk about it at a relatively high level for those that just kind of want the, the sort of passing story. Uh, but then for people who want to learn more, you know, try and give them a little bit more detail around exactly how do things, things work. Um, we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about um, the different models, right? So the increasing price model that we talked about, which is this pay as you go, as well as the prepay model, right? So, and we, we try and talk about, you know, what you pay for your subscription versus what the bill credit is. We try and be very straightforward about, you know, if the bill credit rate increases higher than a historic rate, you'll save even more. But if increases at a very low rate, you know, you might break even or even lose, lose a little bit of money relative to if you hadn't participated, right? And so we try and just be really upfront about these things. Um, and a big part of what we also then have on the website is we talk about the subscriber agreement and what that entails. We talk about the exit provisions. Again, these are the ones that we talked through, right? What are they? What should you expect? Right? And so actually we've gone through this web application with uh, the, the, all the head energy officials at the Department of Commerce with the clean energy uh, resource team. Uh, we've talked about it with a lot of the NGOs, right? Like Fresh Energies and those. We've reviewed it with Excel as well. And so we've really made an effort to try and have those eyeballs on the service to make sure that we're being accurate and honest with how we're describing the community solar program. And if any of you guys go home and use this, even if you're not interested in subscribing, just poke around and you guys have feedback for us, let us know because as it says at the top of the website, we're in a beta version. So we're basically at a point now where we're just looking for a lot of feedback on the service. Um, but then when you're, when you're ready, oops, when you're ready, um, if and when I should say you're ready, you can actually then start the, the process of, of shopping for a community solar subscription. So, so. Is, is, is this access uh, co-ops too or is it just Excel? So uh, what we have right now is, so in a co-ops territory, there's only one option. So what we do is when you put in your zip code and you, we figure out, so basically here, right, you put in your zip code and it figures out what your utility is and what your county is. And so if that's a co-op, we basically just say, hey, uh, this co-op runs, runs their own community solar program and here's the link to find more, right? So we don't surface that, but we try and point you in the right direction, right? Um, so here, this is a zip code for South Minneapolis. It's Excel, it's Hennepin County. Let's say, let's say my electric bill is $100 a month. You can go to preview quotes. So basically what this shows is with just your zip code and knowing hence your utility and what county you're in, it just shows you what quotes are available. So you just, you know before you kind of just take the next step that, oh, there's something available and oh, this is intriguing enough to, to proceed. So with that, you can finish the sign-up process. No one look at where I live, please. I tried going fast past it, but someone's gonna freeze that. Um, MRES uh, test two, because I think I tested this right before I started. So basically, once you finish your sign-up process, then you get this set of quotes from community solar providers. Again, these are just placeholder quotes because it's being filmed. We didn't want to show you the actual numbers from providers in our, that are in our system. 
If you can't tell, my partner and I are both physics majors as undergrads, so you may recognize some of these names as famous physicists. This crowd might appreciate that. Um, so here, at, a very, at first at a very high level, we just try and show you basically who's the provider, right? So Newton Electric, Ampere. Um, we provide ratings of reviews of those providers. We don't rate and review providers, but other users of our service can leave ratings and reviews of those providers that you can see, right? So, you know, how was their customer service experience? Was it straightforward to work with them, right? That can give, start to give you a little bit of indication about that. Um, and then the next kind of set of information is just really high level what this subscription is all about. So, for example, so for example, here is a prepay with, with what you would owe up front for this prepay model. And here's est an estimate of how much you would save per year, right? So you, yeah, you pay a lot up front, but your savings per year is actually quite high. Um, here, this is an increasing price model, right? So this is, again, this pay as you go. It's, it's a very common type of uh, subscription. Um, your, your savings is quite a bit less, but you're not paying anything, but, but you're not paying anything up front. Um, uh, uh, also, we just try and give some very kind of, uh, uh, kind of schematic metrics of things to consider, right? So how certain are your savings? This gets to the idea of basically how low is that escalator on your subscription rate, right? If it's lower, your savings is going to be a lot more certain. We talk about near-term weighted savings. Well, what does that mean? That just gets to the idea is, is your savings earlier in the 25 years or later, right? If it's the same total dollars, you prefer it to be earlier rather than later. And then the last one is just ease of exit. So we try and roll up how easy it is to get out of a subscriber agreement and just kind of show them in a really high level, you know, kind of qualitative or semi-quantitative sense. And then let's say, okay, that's a, that's a good looking, handsome physicist there. I'm interested in learning more about this one, right? And so at this time, then you can go in and basically kind of see the, the full details about this. Um, so you can look at your savings, right? So here, here's the initial subscription rate. Here's what it escalates at. Here's your total estimated saving over 25 years. And, and some people might just be interested in that, right? Relatively high level. But some people, for those who want to, can kind of really dig in. You know, what's the first year savings? What's the last year savings? We show it to you graphically. You can change what the assumption is about how the bill credit rate increases. So if you want to test a lower number or a higher number, right? So if you test 4.5%, oh, look, your savings are much higher, right? If you, sit, if you test 2.5%, oh, actually in this case, it would have just about broken even over the 25 years. Right? So we allow you to try and test some of those things yourself. Um, savings and risk, so this, again, what, at what bill credit rate would you break even over the life of the subscription? Exit provisions, so we basically go through each one of the different exit provisions, remind you of what they are and then tell you what, what this provider offers for their exit terms. So in this case, moving within the territory, no fee. Transferring to someone else, $50 fee, right? And so we try and step through all that for you. Right? And you can kind of go back and forth between the different ones, compare, see, you know, see which ones you like best. Um, talk a little bit, there's the solar installation. Um, you can go into that and learn more. There's operator profiles that you can click through and you can kind of see a, a lot more details about any given operator. And basically, when you're ready, I'll, I'll go back here to the quotes page. So you can compare, you can look into details in any one of these. And then when you're ready, um, or actually one thing I should say before that is, um, once you've gotten your quotes, your information isn't made available to the providers, right? And so in that sense, it's meant to be a very kind of hassle-free way of looking at for a community solar. So you're only engaging with them when you want to. We're available to answer questions. If you want to email us a question or call to ask a question about how community solar, we'll answer questions about how community solar works. And if you want, you can actually ask the providers anonymously about how their subscription works through our messaging center. So the whole idea here is to try and make it kind of a low pressure experience, right? So some of the things we pride ourselves on is just open, accurate, honest, and pressure free and simple and one kind of a one stop shop. But let's say you're interested, then basically uh, we kind of just remind you, hey, before you, you know, before you proceed, this is the step where we're actually going to provide your information to the provider. And so if you were to hit confirm here, then your information at that point would be, would be given to the provider and then they would send you their draft subscriber agreement and follow up to answer any final questions you might have 
before you decide if you want to sign up for that or not. So that's basically our service. So you folks make money being an aggregator, as it were? You get paid by the sick? So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very similar business model to kayak.com or other server comparison shopping services where the providers pay us a little bit of money if anyone finds a subscription to them through our service, right? And we do it that way so that we don't want it to cost anything to use the service, right? And so that's how we support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, as a free day, could I go back in and use this and see? I'm not quite sure where I'm at. I can maybe see through this. Um, I don't know that you'd be able to see where an existing subscription is at, right? Because this is meant to look for new subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can a provider sign up subscriptions through their site? Or do they do that on their own? So, so they would actually follow up on their own and provide you the subscriber agreement and sign up. And part of the reason that we don't go all the way through okay. is because, for, for example, the pay-as-you-go models, a provider needs to run a credit check. And for example, we don't, we don't want to handle the credit information, right? And so that last, it's that last, this gives you kind of the shopping piece, but it's that last step of basically getting the subscriber agreement. You know, they're in a better position to answer, answer any questions you have about their specific ex subscriber agreement, right? So you don't sign up through here. You that last step to it now. Was there a fee for a subscriber to be listed on your site? Uh, uh, so, 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 so uh, potential. So, users of the site. So, someone who would subscribe, they don't. There's no. There's no fees to use the service. And the providers, the community solar providers, they just pay if, if they get a subscription through our service. But not for a listing. Not for a not listing. Not to be presented. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm actually, I just noticed the, I keep on calling up the Twitter feed. Um, so I actually just noticed that it's about 7 o'clock, and so to try and wrap it up in a timely fashion. Um, you can take another 10 minutes, Dan, if you need. Well, I'll tell you what, I will, I will wrap it up, and then if there's any final questions, we can go through those. Um, but so uh, basically, we got this service up and running. We started uh, kind of at the beginning of last summer. We built a little uh, prototype. We got a lot of positive feedback. We then, uh, over the course of the fall, we built a, this beta version. And then basically, in the first couple of months of winter here, we got a couple of providers on board, uh, Community Energy Solar and Cooperative Energy Futures, and are continually looking to add new providers. And we've actually just gone live. So people can now go and find subscriptions through our service. It just so happens that our first two providers have uh, uh, gardens that are located and have subscriptions available in Dakota, Rice, and Goodhue counties. So think of places like South St. Paul, Invergrove Heights, Mendota Heights, Lakeville. You can see the rest of the list there. Does anyone live in one of those areas and is an Excel customer? All right, Doug, you're going to test this service for us then. <laughs> so, um, so this is where we're available now, but check back in a month or two and, and we should actually be able to cover the Twin Cities in a, in a broader area as well. So, so that's, that's kind of who we are and uh, what our service is. And I think we'll kind of wrap it up here, but just we're happy to stick around and answer any final questions. You know, how, what's controlling the credit rate? Is that a state statute or is that Excel coming up with what they want to improve and getting approval through the Minnesota Public Utility Commission. Because that it seems like the revenues that one would receive are really based upon that credit you get. And that's 25 years from now. Yeah. You know, we thought that metering was a sacred cow until the rope how some of the rope hops found a way to charge so yeah. much for the access meter access that it, you know they're kind of putting out the flame and you know, or make it yeah. out of reasonable to have solar in some areas. Yeah. And Excel seems to be our friend right now. I mean, they have all the best programs. So I'm, I'm just curious who, yeah. who determines that rate? Yeah. And if someone wanted to attack it, how would they do that? So there was, um, there was, it was a combination of through the statute and through the follow-on regulations where the bill credit rates were set. And actually what it was is a formula was determined. And then that formula is what you calculate what the bill credit rate is every year, right? And then and and that gets locked in that you're going to use that formula when a garden is established, right? And so if a garden is established now and the community solar rules change in two years, 
it's still got to have, use that formula and that rate for the 25 year life of the project. And so in that sense, the rules governing the bill credit rates live on with that guard through the life, even if the rules for, for future community solar changes, right? And so actually what you've seen is the rules are actually, in the, the, they, have, they have actually recently changed for new guards, right? And so for what we've talked about, that's how it's been kind of here to four. And then in the future, it's gonna to go to something different called value solar and it'll work a little bit differently, but actually no one has yet put in applications for that. And so we haven't showed you any of what that, that looks like. But so there isn't really a risk of those rules changing retroactively because it's designed to go with the life of the project. Now there's always a risk that, you know, kind of to your question about like, are people going after the community solar in some way in the legislature or whatever, there's a chance that the rules change over time for new projects, right? But there, it's explicitly meant to not then affect the existing projects. For better or worse. Actually. For better or for worse. But generally, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's nice as a subscriber to, to know that your rules are locked in for the the project. May I ask how you'll be advertising this so everybody knows about it? Great. Um, so the main thing that we will do is what we have found is that there's a lot of groups out there that really want to make people aware of community solar or even promote community solar, but they, but they don't want to promote, for example, one specific provider, right? And so when we have showed them this tool, they've been really excited about it because they're like, this is great. I can make people aware of community solar and they can make the final choice themselves. And so, for example, we've talked with a lot of cities that themselves have signed up commute with community solar to save money on their municipal electric bills. And they want to get these out to they want to get this out to the residents, you know, through their newsletters and through events and through you know uh, listing on their web pages and those kinds of things, right? Same thing with environmental groups, you know, some some building building managers like apartment managers, condos associations, right? So a lot of these types of groups where where a single provider is unable, oftentimes unable to work with them to market their service, they want to work with a service like ours. Because again, it allows their constituents to choose a subscription themselves. My, my biggest question is, uh, why isn't Excel just building solar farms? Why, I guess, why this route of, of yeah. community solar? Are they trying to settle yeah. risk or responsibility on different groups other than themselves? Or because the statute said they had to. So the statute specifically, the way that the statute is written is that the utility that owns either the Prairie Island or the Monticello nuclear power plant has to administer a community solar program that allows third party providers to build installations and offer subscriptions. And so that's Excel, right? So they're required to, be <coughs> to host this program. Okay, as opposed to do it themselves, mm -hmm. as opposed to build the solar farms themselves. <coughs> they're, I mean, they're also building solar, solar themselves, but they're required to accept these projects. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they're, so they're building their own solar, some very large utility scale solar, but they're required to accept these projects that they apply and they go through the application process and they meet all the conditions. Okay. Yeah. So, so in effect, the, this setup allows the fostering of small solar companies as opposed to the folks that can service several megawatts of contract yeah. with Excel. Yeah. yeah, and so it does really support a lot of local solar generation, right? And, and actually, if you look at the people who are building and building these projects and, and offering subscriptions, a lot of them are Minnesota-based companies, right? And so it has really done a lot to foster the, the, the solar industry here in the state. There is a top level at where Excel is gonna say, okay, we've reached this maximum. Yes. This is the point we're gonna be at. We don't have to offer this out here anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they're required to get one and a half percent of their electricity generation from solar. I forget the exact year, I think it might be 2020, but don't quote me on that. It's not like it's gonna be on video or anything. Um, and, and basically, once that responsibility is met, then they would, my understanding is they would need to accept future projects, but that's also a ways out, and who knows what the rule, how the rules will evolve. Is that kilowatt hours or kilowatt maximum? Kilowatt hours, yeah, energy, not power. Can Excel build their own community solar gardens and then ask for subscriptions? Because, or is that not done? Um, I mean, a representative from Excel should should answer some of these very Excel. So they have questions. it, yeah. Because I think they, I've seen ads 
in order to sell, but that's not for their own they, stuff. They have some alternative renewable energy programs that don't look quite like this and look a little bit different. I see. So it doesn't, it's, it's not organized in the same way, and they have some other benefits, right, that someone would consider. Yeah. I was wondering, I, I saw some, um, some of those ones offered through Excel, and I just wondered if you could do both or how that might affect. Um, uh, in some cases, you can. You could sign up for community solar and for wind source, for example, right? Um, and in some cases, you can. Okay. Can I ask what the scope of what you intend to cover? Are you focused on Twin Cities, Minnesota, nationwide, yeah. global? For the near future, we're focused on Minnesota. So making sure that we add the providers and you know, basically we want to make sure that anyone who's interested in community solar and is an Excel customer can come here and find uh, you know, find something to evaluate. So it's your goal and to get all community solar uh, options that <coughs> exist on your website? We we would uh, we would be we would love to get as many as we could. So but is yeah. it the case where you would add it only if they agree to pay for you know, if a subscription comes through your service, otherwise you're not going to get it or what? Yeah, we, so we have our business arrangements right. that, that'll make sense. So it has to make sense for both parts. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if we use your service, we're going to find all existing options. Mm -hmm. We might still have to keep looking. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel.